Amen. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the of Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. I uh, did a uh, lesson a few weeks back, right, three weeks back or so, called Memorial Stones, Lessons from Our History. And uh, I'm going to do a second one. I don't know that I can, uh, that I will do this every week because now we have 53 years worth of, uh, but I will, uh, I will do some of these lessons from time to time. The point of these is that uh, we're going to read a scripture, rehearsing history is a very important part of living for God. It helps you to maintain who you are and where, if you know where you came from. And so what I did is uh, the founder of our fellowship, my father, uh, Pastor Wayman Mitchell, he's the one who founded it and uh, pastored this church for uh, almost 50 years or over 50 years, I guess. And so we are uh, looking at where did we come from? And so I'm telling the history of my parents, their ministry, because this affects even what we do today. Many of the things that we do, things that we believe, how we approach ministry. So that's what we're doing. Let's read Joshua 4, 4 through 7. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord, your God, and into the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, we're just talking, we're still talking about early years here. Uh, we wound up from my parents' uh, uh, early life and salvation, we finally wound up. They went into the ministry in Wickenburg, Arizona. Uh, one more lesson from Wickenburg, Arizona. And there's a, a major lesson my dad learned in, in ministry that he applied for the rest of his life and he preached often. It was the priority of ministry. When... Dad was offered the pastorate of the church in Wickenburg. This is the first church where he would be the actual pastor. He was the youth pastor at that time in the church that he got saved in in Phoenix. And when he became a pastor, he made up his mind to devote himself to the ministry. This was not something he was going to do on the side. He absolutely gave it his all. So... In order to uh, accomplish that, the church had no money. He had to work a job. So he took a job as a washing machine repairman, and he worked just enough hours a week to barely survive. At that time, they had two kids. Uh, uh, Karen and Sharon uh, were already born. Rhonda was born in Wickenburg, now with three children. He worked just enough so they could barely scrape by because he said, I'm here to preach. I'm not here to work. And that was important. And he, he said for the rest of his life, they made a sacrifice at that point in time for the ministry. For all of his life, he credits that period of time for the future of his ministry because he said because he didn't work a lot of hours, what he did is he spent many hours studying in depth Bible doctrines, Bible themes, learning how to preach, and he said that was the foundation for his entire ministry. This is why in later years you used to hear him preach about pastors. He said, you are hobby pastors. In other words, there are men that they, they want to preach the gospel, but they want to have a fantastic lifestyle from the beginning. They want to be blessed. They want to have the latest, the greatest. They have to live at a certain standard. And he said, so ministry is a hobby to you. You don't have time 
to devote yourself. So that is a powerful lesson. We gain the benefit of things that Pastor Mitchell learned in Wickenburg, Arizona. One of those, you remember in early days here, he preached or taught a, a series of lessons on the church. It was in Wickenburg. That's where he formed convictions and understanding about the church. So that is a lesson that uh, uh, the priority of ministry. Second lesson that my father learned that would actually affect our entire fellowship to this day had to do with the heart for missions. As soon as my dad got to saved, God put in his heart a love for missions. And by that, I mean preaching the gospel outside the borders of your own country. In the church that he got saved in, in Phoenix, Arizona, two things would happen. Number one is that they would invite missionaries to come and speak uh, in, in, in the church. And every time a missionary came, my dad was absolutely enthralled with that. That was so exciting to him. He would ask questions about that, making very, very little money, but he always made sure that he and my mom, they gave money <clears throat> to support missions. Dad would often tell a story. He said one time a missionary came and dad wanted to do something to invest and help this man's ministry, but they had absolutely no money at the time. But dad had a rifle. It had been given to him by his father. It was a Henry repeating rifle uh, that uh, he had used since he was a boy. And that was all that he had of value. And he, he went to the missionary and he said, I, I want to help you. I don't have any money. But he said, could you use this rifle? He brought it to church. Could you use this rifle in your ministry? And the man said, sure. Dad said later on, he realized with experience, that man couldn't use it in the, in the ministry. He just wanted the rifle. But dad gladly gave it. Anyway, simply, that I'm telling that story, he had a heart. I want to invest, I want to be a part of what God is doing in world evangelism. But how many of you know nothing you give to God is lost? Right? That guy may have been scamming my dad, but it doesn't matter. It's not lost. Matthew 10, 42. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Okay, uh, so this, this text uh, no doubt applies to my father. Whoever gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple. In other words, whatever you give to God, it is never lost. So dad, I, I, I believe God knew his heart. But that is something powerful always from the beginning of his salvation in early ministry. Dad had a heart for missions. The second thing that uh, influenced my dad in missions is that in his home church, back then, you remember he was saved in 1953, they showed uh, uh, missions movies from a man named T.L. Osborne. T.L. Osborne was one of the premier uh, healing evangelists. He held healing crusades and he held many healing crusades in other nations. And so they would show these. Uh, he would see there's a, a famous one called the Holland Wonder. It's a crusade he held in Den Haag in Holland in the 1950s. He, he had to, there would be movies that he made of his crusades in Indonesia, Philippines, Mexico, different ones. And so <clears throat> there were a number of things that, that happened by dad watching those movies. Number one is it, it increased the burden when he would see people from other nations that needed the gospel getting saved and getting healed. My dad was absolutely thrilled because that's what he wanted to be a part of was in missions but these movies actually had a second very powerful benefit that affects us today. And that is that these films actually showed T.L. Osborne praying for the sick. So you have to understand in those days, 
in his home church, they didn't pray for the sick. He didn't know anybody who prayed for the sick. Remember in my first lesson, I told you, in fact, in Bible school, they actually taught against divine healing in some ways, even though it was supposed to be a, a, a Pentecostal uh, Bible college. But he is watching movies, seeing actual footage of a man praying for the sick. So here's something you don't know. If you saw my father pray for the sick, how many of you ever saw dad in a crusade? You went to a crusade, Mexico, Philippines. Okay. If you saw how he approached praying for the sick, you saw T.L. Osborne's approach. When, when the crusade, when dad would step up and he would say, Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead and therefore we're going to see him do miracles tonight. That is something he saw T.L. Osborne do and he adopted that. The pattern of sick, uh, praying for the sick in, in mass prayers. Lay hands on your body. Command the sickness when we pray to leave. Thank God for healing and afterwards check your body. That was something he saw in actual praying for the sick. And my father said, that is what I want to have at work in, in my life. But there's a, a third thing is that in these films that T.L. Osborne showed, he didn't just show crusades and praying for the sick. T.L. Osborne uh, trained native workers in each nation. It would be in Africa, Philippines, wherever it was. He would train them how to do what he did. He, they actually had, a, it was quite ingenious. They, uh, some of these places, they didn't have cars. They would give them a bicycle and they would give them a film projector and a film of a, a healing crusade and would have them spread out and would show these films, preach the gospel, get people saved, and then they would pray for the sick. So this is profound because something impacted my, uh, my father very much is that he saw the indigenous principle. If we can train native workers to reach their own people, that is how we should approach. The missionary is someone, his job is to train native workers to do what he did. That is very powerful. And if you understand anything about our fellowship, you, you know that we are now in, uh, I think, 137 different nations. And that is what we do, is we send missionaries to get the people of that land saved so that they can fulfill the Great Commission in their own nation. So that is a, a very powerful principle, has to do with Dad's heart for missions. Then we move on in ministry from Canada, or, or from uh, Wickenburg, we moved to Canada. In late 1962, I think maybe early 1963, Dad's dream came true. He wanted to be a missionary. My parents wanted to be missionaries, and now the dream came true. A church opened up in Canada. In uh, uh, the little town was called Courtney in British Columbia. It was located on Vancouver Island, at, just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. And so Dad was going to go. Now, because we have uh, we have the Hessenauers here and we have Doreen, for their sake, I'm not going to make cheap jokes about Canadian savages. I will not do that. Uh, I mock the Aussies, but I will not, I will not mock the, the Canadians here. But now my parents, they were missionaries. In going to Canada, a simple event happened that actually formed some foundational ideas for the fellowship in later years. They are going to move. Now they're, uh, I think they had uh, four kids. Um, uh, Karen, Sharon, Debbie, and Rhonda. Rhonda was the last she was born in, in Wickenburg. They're going to move to Canada with everything. They were given $200 to move to another country. And they had to get this done. 
So in order for that to happen, they had to get rid of a lot of their stuff, number one. Number two, as they start on the way, their old car broke down and he had to spend a good portion of that $200 repairing the car. So he said they arrived to set up a new life in a new country with $11 to their name. That, that had a profound impact uh, on my dad. You have to understand now, you, you, things in a denomination, things are centralized. So my father would say to his pastors that he wanted to be a missionary, but the church doesn't send them you then applied to the organization. It was central. Who decides who becomes missionaries? Headquarters. Where does all the money go of world evangelism? Headquarters. So now headquarters say, okay, we have an opening, and they are only willing to give you $200 to get that done. So this made a profound impact on my dad when he lands with $11 to his name. So here's a, a lesson that was imprinted on my father, and that lesson is financial support for the ministry. Somehow, it wasn't just for him, but somehow dad said, this isn't right. He said, if you believe in someone's mission, you should support it. If you say, we, we want to reach the world, you probably should put some money behind that to enable uh, the job to get done. And so at the back of my dad's mind was, someday, if I am in a position to, I want to support workers properly. I don't want them to be starving. I don't want them to be struggling uh, uh, to where they can't even uh, barely survive. But that was foundational. You got to remember that he didn't understand how would that work? I don't know. All he said is that what's happened to me is, is probably not the right approach, and someday I want to do something different. Courtney B.C., he said they're very, very nice uh, uh, people there. He's now beginning, and so Dad did what he had been taught in Foursquare, and that is you use competitions in church in order to get people to bring people. Okay, think about this. In our church, we tell you you should witness. We preach on evangelism and preaching the gospel. That is not how it worked. His approach that he had been taught was you organize competitions. One of them, I don't, I don't think my dad thought this up. It probably was pre-existing is that they had a competition going in the, in, in the church. Whoever brought the most people to church would win a trip to Hawaii. <laughs> now think about that. I, I, a man told me this yesterday, and I'll explain that in a minute. Okay. A lady in church named Pearl Cochran wanted to win. So she asked her co-worker, who had three children, her co-worker had no interest in coming to church, but she said, can I bring your kids to church? Because she wanted a day, because the numbers were recorded, and the total is, is whoever gets the most wins. Les Tice is a little boy. His sisters, they took them off to Sunday school. He was too young, sitting there, you know, coloring while my father is preaching, in later years, Les Tice got saved. He was from Courtney. He got saved in one of our churches in Canada and realized that he had been in a service with my father. He now pastors the church in Edmonton, Alberta, in Canada. So there's a lesson in life. Seeds you plant are never wasted. Whatever you do for God is never wasted. Think about that. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Okay, so here you, you, sometimes you do things for God and you think, did that do any good? 
I know no one here ever feels that way, but it's like, that was a waste. I don't think that achieved anything. That's a powerful scripture. Seeds planted, they do grow, they never go to waste. Very interesting story. <clears throat> Les Tice reminded me uh, of this yesterday. Dad uh, had told us kids this story many times through the years. In uh, Foursquare, they had an annual convention that was held in Los Angeles. Again, for some of you, the, all you know is, is what, the way we do things. When we send workers, we send the Duffs, we send, you know, whoever, whatever, couples, uh, uh, the uh, different ones that we plant in different cities or even different nations. When it's conference time, we want them to be here so we pay their way. Okay, why do we do that? All right. That's not the way it was in Foursquare. They have an annual convention. Imagine for pastors, you are on the front lines. You're dealing with people problems. You're being assaulted by hell. You're struggling. You're frustrated. You desperately need preaching. You need to get around other pastors and be encouraged and be in the, in the presence of God to help you. But my parents are pastoring a, a very small church in Canada they do not have the money flying, you know, almost didn't exist uh, easily in those days. So the only option was to drive. But remember, their, their old car needed help even to get to Canada. There is no way he's going to be able to drive it there and back. A nice couple in the church, this, the same lady who wanted to win the competition, Ken and Pearl Cochran, they had a brand new car and knowing that my parents want, wanted to go to a uh, conference, they loaned my parents their brand new car to drive from Vancouver, Canada, all the way to Los Angeles and back. I, I looked at the mileage. He put about three and a half thousand miles on that man's brand new car. Now think about that. So here were people, you know, some of you, would you be willing to do that? Here's my brand new car, I'm gonna trust you to go to another country and put all these kinds of miles. So here's, a, here's a, a lesson in life, and that is other people enable ministry. That, that's power, think about this, this couple. My parents kept contact with Ken and Pearl Cochran through the years, wherever they were, they would uh, exchange letters or postcards uh, a few times through the years. Dad would, Mom and Dad went and visited them. Uh, I think that Pearl was still alive up until uh, just before my dad passed away in 2020. The, the Ken had passed away some years before that. Think about, there are people in church that they make a pastor's life difficult. But Ken and Pearl said, how can we help your ministry? That, that is very powerful. When people have that kind of heart, Ken and Pearl Cochran have a part in everything my parents ever became. You understand that? Can you imagine when they get to heaven? All they're doing is in this slice of time, but how God looks at it, when you invest in somebody's life, everything they become everything they become, you get a piece of that. Let's look at a scripture, Philippians 4, 16 and 17. For, <clears throat> for even in Thessalonica, <clears throat> you sent aid once again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Okay, so he, Paul is talking about support of his missionary ministry from a local church, and he said... This is fruit, it abounds or multiplies. That's what Ken and Pearl Cochran would experience. Everything, the Prescott Church later on, just investing in ministry, enabling. You know, in life, you probably should make up your mind, I don't want to be a vex in ministry. I want to be a blessing. So I mean, that'd be a good, that'd be a very, very good, good lesson. <laughs> Let's bow our heads, amen. No. <clears throat> Dad said that he and my mom, they felt very, very isolated when they went to Canada. Obviously, there was a distance uh, issue, but it was more than distance. They weren't being sent 
by the local church, right? That's not how it worked. You, my parents were responding to a need in the organization or the denomination. So when you went there, it wasn't like your pastor is sending you, so you keep a, 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 this great connection with your pastor. What happened is you are responding to the organization. When you get there, you have an area supervisor. So the area supervisor is supposed to help, but the problem is you have no real connection with them. You might get to know them, but there was not a real connection. This formed a later foundation for our fellowship. That is absolutely not how we approach things. And that is, Dad said there must be spiritual support for pastors. That was, that was something that he said we... In some way, in ministry, there needs to be a connection with the local church, with your pastor, because that is what provides spiritual support. My parents, they, they grew very, very discouraged at the lack of results. The, uh, numerically, the, the church in, in Courtney was not a, not a raging success. And then isolation, lack of support, my dad came to the point he was so discouraged, he said, there is no point in going on in ministry. He says, I should not be a pastor. So he resigned, not just that church, my dad quit the ministry altogether. And in, in his mind, they, they moved to Scottsdale, Arizona, and dad wound up getting a job. So here's, here's a lesson I want to I give you. This is a, actually a life lesson. Dad would use this with other people, and that is you shouldn't measure your future by your current situation. When my dad resigned the ministry, in his mind, he assumed that they would never pastor again. He, he wasn't just, I'm bummed out now, but we'll get another church next week. In his mind... I don't have what it takes. My dad lacked confidence, and he said, I don't think I'll ever pastor again. And so in 1965, they moved to Scottsdale, Arizona. I got a picture. This week, we got a picture there, and I want you to notice mostly that beautiful baby. Man, who could that be? <clears throat> here's, uh, here's the five kids. And I point out this uh, picture is born, I was born in September of 1964. Actually, I'm, I'm wrong. They moved in 1964. Uh, and the important issue there is that uh, mom got pregnant with me in Canada. So that's why Doreen loves me so much. <laughs> I have maple syrup in my blood. I, I am technically a Canadian, if you think about it. So this is uh, now in Scottsdale, uh, Arizona. Dad started working a job, and they just attended a local church. Remember, he said, I don't think I'll ever be a pastor again. He worked with a man, also a Christian, who also had been a pastor and in frustration had quit the ministry. So now two frustrated ex-pastors are working together. In those days, this is when people... Uh, the Pentecostal movement was starting to take off, but they kept running into people or they would attend churches that said they were Pentecostal and they, they, he, he said there were crazy things going on in those churches. And they would, they would sometimes attend services together or they would talk about different places they had been. And they kept saying to each other, man, that church was crazy surely we could do a better job than that. And so finally one day, they had the idea, why don't we start our own church? And this would not be in Foursquare. They, they said, let's start our own church. And so they did. They rented a beat up old house in Scottsdale, Arizona. And they uh, kind of uh, rigged a, a little awning. It wasn't hot. Yet in Phoenix, it soon would be, but they were able to meet kind of uh, under a little bit of a shelter in, in Phoenix, Arizona. And they started this church with both of them as co-pastors. And so he said that 
word spread and the church uh, began to grow. But dad learned a, a lesson that was very important and in some ways affects us to this day. And that lesson is pastoring by committee doesn't work. That's, that's an important lesson. And this, this was foundational. Dad said, we had a church, not with a pastor and assistant pastor. They were both equal co-pastors. And dad said, we created a two-headed monster. And he said that, that that doesn't work. But that actually was foundational. Dad began to see some things in, in the way that, that he saw churches were run. Often churches were run by boards or councils or committees or elders are different and dad said I don't think that's biblical that was number one he didn't agree that it was biblical but he said practically that is that just doesn't work and that became that's something that is foundational in the way our churches are structured even today so now he's co-pastoring with this man the church is growing but the man who was pastoring with him uh, dad began to see and, and began to feel that this man in his dealings with people was manipulative in, uh, in ways that were not good and even borderline dishonest. And so my dad came to a decision. He said, I cannot participate in dishonesty. I don't want to treat people like that. I do not manipulate people. I certainly am not going to lie to them or be dishonest in many ways and so he made a decision he resigned he said to the other man you you have the church i'll i'll move on because i don't want to be a part of that so here's a lesson in life it, it uh, of course has affected us but this is true for you as well and that is god can guide honest people my dad made a simple decision and that decision was i want to be honest Proverbs 11.3 says, good people will be guided by honesty. Dishonesty will destroy those who are not trustworthy. The first part is very powerful. Think about this. My dad doesn't understand a lot of things about ministry and life, but he said, I want to be honest. That text says, if you want to be honest, God will guide you. And that is true as we look later on is how God did that. We move on in ministry now in uh, 1966. Dad wanted to return to the ministry. He contacted uh, uh, people in the Foursquare organization and said he would like to pastor again. And they offered him a church in a little farming community called Emmett in the state of Idaho. And this farming community is not much money uh, now, this would be probably my early memories of life. There, uh, people didn't have much money. There were people that they would pay their tithes in fruit and vegetables. I don't think dad was terribly in favor of that, but I remember we ate good in, in, uh, in Canada. There's a, a story that occurred in his ministry in Emmett, Idaho, that uh, you no doubt have heard dad and me tell, and that was that the local funeral director contacted him and said, he, he kind of liked dad. He said, people come to us sometimes and they have a relative that uh, needs a funeral, needs a burial, and they don't go to church, they don't have a pastor. So he said, would you be willing to uh, perform funerals for people? And dad said, sure, he would do that. He did that to help. He did that to meet people. And I think that uh, the guy paid him 10 bucks to do a funeral as well, and so money was tight, so he said, okay, dad tells a story. He said, one day the man said, someone has died, they arranged a date and a time for the funeral, and the man said, I'll pick you up. He said, they picked him up, and he rode with two funeral guys uh, in the hearse. They've got the body in the back. They're driving out into the country. There's a small little building, I don't know if it was a chapel or whatever it was, a little hall, where they're gonna have it, they wheel out the body, they set up the flowers, everything. And then the man says, the hall is completely empty, and he says to dad, go ahead. And my dad said, there's, there's no one here. And he said, that's right, no one's coming. Dad said, this man was 67 years old and not one person came to his funeral. That, that impacted my dad in, in many ways. And he said there's a, a lesson that he learned. He said in life, you have to live in such a way that you make impact on other people. 
in the choices, how you treat people, what you do in life, you better make sure that your life is making impact. Because he said, I don't want to end my life and no one would care. Right? That's a choice that all of us can make. Dad had, it, something had been drilled into him in Bible school, and that was their philosophy of ministry was the way to reach adults is through their kids. A scripture that was drilled into him was Isaiah 11:6 that says, a little child shall lead them. He'd been taught that over and over again. Never mind that that scripture is taken completely out of context. It's talking about the millennium. Always a bad idea when you apply a millennium scripture and you base your life on it. But So what that means is that he had been taught how you build a church is through kids programs. Many of these were, were often for the kids they would run. Remember I told you about that competition uh, that was the first time I had ever, Les Tice told me that, that it was a trip to Hawaii. Usually it was who can win the big chocolate candy bar and, you know, the big, a big, I remember one time, they, I remember this as a kid, the competition was you would win a six foot long banana split. <laughs> That's what every child needs is a six foot, they, they, they did it, so... It was competition. I got a, a picture. These are some pictures actually from Emmett, Idaho. And you see these are children's ministry. On the left, the girl in the center, that's my sister Rhonda. Uh, on the right, you see in the far left corner, that's dad. Mom is on the back row. She's third from the right. That's my mom. Uh, that is Rhonda on the front row. Uh, by golly, I think that's me on the, on the left. I didn't realize that was me. That's Rhonda, second, and then fourth over, that's my sister Debbie. But you see here, this is often what they had. It was competitions. It was children's programs. And one thing, it's hard for you to see, in, in Foursquare in those days, they would put the, up on the back wall, they would post the previous week's attendance and offerings. And one of the things you can see in the right there on the left is, you see, there's the attendance. They had 179 people in church that day. That church was doing very, very well. It had grown. But you see on the left, in January, for world missions, they raised $144.42. And this was something that my father believed in always in his churches. He did. But anyway, back to the children's ministry. My dad began to see... He's following, my mom and, and he were heavily involved in all kinds of children's ministries, hoping, the idea was, if we can attract local kids, then their parents will come. And he said, it doesn't work. You get the kids to come. And he said, what the parents would do is like, we got a free hour. They would gladly dump their kids and they go off and have a great time and then pick their kids up later. Dad said, if you get kids, you don't necessarily get the parents. But then he got a few people saved. He said, if you get the parents saved, and especially if you get dad saved, you will get the kids. So this began, just at the back of his mind, uh, began a fundamental shift in how he was going to approach ministry. And this is one of the very, very important uh, things. Remember I told you in, in week one, my parents were not raised in church at all. Both of them only ever went to church twice their entire life up until the point they got saved. What my dad wanted was converts like, like them. He was, he was a, a, a drinker and a smoker, gambler. He, he, he was a sinner got saved and powerfully transformed. My mom was, was born again and changed. And he, my dad didn't want to play church. He had a lot of nice church people. He had a few people saved. But my dad said, a church needs to be built on converts. He didn't know how that was going to happen. But that was something that was fundamental. One other thing that happened in Emmett, Idaho... 
is that uh, I, I told you last week, God will put people in your life. And that is uh, one of the men, his name was John Metzler. He had gone to Bible school with John Metzler. They had a kindred spirit. They loved the things of God. They loved missions. They loved the supernatural. And so in Emmett, Idaho, uh, he invited his old friend, John Metzler, to uh, come. And oh yeah, here's uh, other pictures. This is dad standing out in front of the church. And here is an actual picture of the church in uh, Emmett, Idaho. But he invited John Metzler to come and do a revival. John was pastoring in California at that time. He invited him. He held a revival, but John Metzler, how many of you here, you're old enough, you, you met John Metzler, you know him. This is uh, Jolene Metzler is in our church. It's her father. And uh, John Metzler was absolutely supernatural. He had gifts of the spirit. He prayed for the sick. Uh, he got miracles. It was wonderful. And so in this nice church that God was doing some good things, not much, but some good things, John Metzler came and held a very powerful revival. And one of the things that, that happened when we finally get to Prescott, that becomes foundational. John Metzler was very influential in the early days of the Prescott Church. So a number of people got saved at that point in time. And so that was foundational. He had John Metzler then in each of the places that he pastored uh, afterwards. So now then, Coming to the end in uh, Emmett, Idaho, uh, there were, uh, again, now, this was a much more established church. They had more uh, of established power structure of the way the people, uh, you know, pre-existing to him ran the church in, in some ways. And, and, and my dad he said, that, that just doesn't work well. And so uh, out of this, he began to see that, you know, maybe... I should not be in Emmett, Idaho. We should uh, do something else. And so he met a man who pastored in Eugene, Oregon, who had a business close by, if I remember as a dairy farm or something, close by to Emmett and was wanting to move to that area. Dad said in actual fact, his real heart was the business, not the ministry. But they finally talked and that man said, why don't we trade churches? So this is, it'd be very amusing to me to think of, of doing that these days, but that is what they did. And so uh, in 1967, I think, uh, I think late 1967, my parents moved to Eugene, Oregon. And this is, uh, uh, then comes, we only have two more to go before we get to Prescott, but we'll have to leave that for another time. And so... Uh, the point in me, in me telling these stories is these are things in life, God is at work. The point I'm trying to tell you is not reminiscence, uh, reminiscing about my parents. The point is that God is at work. If you keep your heart right, God uses every circumstance to guide you into his will. All of these, there were events that happened to him negative, some of them positive, positive that put things later on when he came to Prescott, some of these things, now he would work out how should a church function in order to fulfill God's will. And so that is my point in telling these stories. Maybe uh, next time then we're gonna talk about Eugene, Oregon, Carson, California, and then finally coming to Prescott, amen. That is. All I have, we're going to have a few extra minutes, and then our service will start at 1030. God bless you. We'll end there.